All right, well, good evening. We are feeling extremely quarrelsome, I think, up here. <laughs> we'll try and pretend we really dislike each other. Um, it's just I should mention that here is further proof of the takeover of the world by argumentative Indians. And uh, it's very nice to have the opportunity to talk to uh, Dr. Martia today. And I'm sure that unlike the liberals Paul mentioned, he will be able to defend his own ideas, but I'm certainly going to ask him to do so. What we're going to do is just, I thought you should know a little bit about this really extraordinary man uh, before we tear him apart. <laughs> um, um, Amartya was born at Shantiniketan. Shantiniketan, um, uh, you may know, is the um, university that was founded on the property of Rabindranath Tagore, the Nobel Laureate for Literature, um, and um, is an extraordinary kind of university in, in India that people have lessons on the trees, and, and it, it has a very kind of um, a different ethic. What I remember, one of the things I remember about it is that at the heart of it, or there's what, where Tagore used to live, that there are three houses around different sides of the same courtyard. One is in a kind of Japanese style, and one is in a Western style, and one is an Indian style. And Tagore used to simply go like this, and the whole household would have to move from one house to another, but it was just across the same courtyard. Um, so this kind of triple self of Rabindranath Tagore, it seems to me, is in a way exceeded by Amartya Sen, whose polymathic abilities are deeply irritating <laughs> and to, to, to those of us less gifted. He, he's a Sanskritist. Um, he has spent much of his life studying not only economics, but also mathematics and physics, and indeed had to, at certain points in his life, decide whether he wanted to be a Sanskritist, a mathematician, a physicist, or an economist. And I know exactly how that feels. <laughs> difficult a choice that must have been. And he has, you know, of late, managed to, um, in a way, use this diversity of self to write a couple of really quite, I think, very important books, uh, The Argumentative Indian and now Identity and Violence. Um, books which take on some of the big subjects of our time, such as where ideas of democracy, pluralism, tolerance come from, and whether they are indeed Western ideas, or whether you can see them have roots elsewhere in the world as well. And, and certainly, his argument is that you can see in the Indian tradition a tradition of argument, of discourse, of tolerance, of multiplicity, of the understanding of pluralism, uh, which has nothing to do with uh, ideas imported from the West. And so to see these as the exclusively Western ideas is a mistake. We'll go into that a little bit more. Um, and we'll go into his thoughts about the relationship, extremely central to the way I think we're all thinking at the moment, the relationship between identity politics um, and violence in, in the world we now live in. Um, of course, migration is a big, it has to be a theme when looking at Amartya's life. I mean, he, he, you, uh, you spent some of your childhood in Burma, is that right? That's right, three yeah. years in Burma, in Mandalay. Yes, so when, at the age of three, you became close friends with George Orwell. Um, <laughs> but, and then immediately left. <laughs> um, then there's a passage in, in England, um, including um, the Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and now in America at Harvard, actually back and forth to America, but, but presently in America at Harvard. So, I mean, it's clear to me, I've always felt that people who have that experience of transcultural migration clearly have to think perhaps more than others about the question of identity because the way in which the self conceives itself has traditionally a lot to do with place, uh, with roots, you know, with, with the place you come from, the language you speak, the community in which you find yourself, the customs of that community. And migrants lose all that, or often do, and have to, in a way, 
question what, wherein their identity lies. So let's just start with that and ask you what, if anything, was the consequence for you of migration and what did it make you think about self, yourself? Well, it certainly made me very aware of a couple of things, that there are lots of people with whom I've been very friendly, going back to my age three, not perhaps to a role, but uh, others around, um, who had a different identity in, in, in the sense that if they were to define themselves as a Bernie, they would, you know, they would be very different. And yet, at the same time, we did share a, a lot of identities uh, together, not just the identity of human being, but being concerned with usual things, uh, where you might be able to get a good ice cream. Uh, and, you know, these uniting factors, which uh, give us a different way of looking at it. So that was one concern. The other concern, of course, that the, uh, you mentioned about India and democracy and so on. I think uh, my thesis, in some ways, is even more ambitious. I'm even beginning to disagree with you. Right? <laughs> 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 no to say that I think they have really uh, arisen almost everywhere in the world. The idea that somehow participatory governance, what Mill called government by discussion, that's a very general idea. And I think in India, what is very special is that, and this is where the verbosity of Indians come in. I mean, we also hold the record of the longest speech ever in the United Nations, nine hours non-stop. Just Krishna and Yeah, every one of the uh, Mahabharata is often compared with the epics. Um, Iliad and Odyssey. Mahabharata is seven times Iliad and Odyssey put together. If it can be said in two pages, you must say it in a line. So I think Given that, there's a lot written on the subject of secularism, democracy, and so on, which are general talk, going back to the Buddhist period, the, the, you know, the, the early Hindu period, as well as after the Mughal, particularly the Mughal, a lot of discussion. So, in, in Tagore, to whom you refer, had this wonderful passage saying the idea of India militates against the strong sense of separateness from one. From, from other people. So in some ways that was very much part of the thing that, uh, that came up, both in my family as well as in school. And having the experience of going to Burma and then traveling within India, and of course, and then eventually going to Britain, that kind of solidified more. So I think it played a very big part. Not so much in, I've never had a sense of a fragility of Indian culture that somehow acknowledging as anything else will immediately make my Indian identity go away. I mean, I think that is a completely invented problem. Um, but do you think that the Indian, uh, this question of the Indian identity, yeah. isn't that itself not that, I mean, I mean quite a recent invention? Um, that's to say, historically there was no India. There, was, there were a number of nations there, which often fought with each other, and even when the British, when the Mughals ran India, they never really controlled the whole place, and when the British ran India, they hardly ever controlled the whole place. And the Indian national idea, you could argue, is quite a recent one. Well, I think now I'm, uh, Paul will be very happy because I think this you can, Yes, we go, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think so. The first book of, on India by Megasthenes is called Indica. What the hell was he writing about? Well, he's talking about a geographical area. But well, you're not talking about your cultural area. He was describing these people to the Greeks. What do the Indians do? When in 7th century E.J., the Chinese visitor, after spending 10 or 11 years in India, doing Sanskrit and also studying medicine, as it happened, went back. His last thought is a very pleasing one, because he had met a lot of Indians. He said, have I come across anyone in India who does not admire China? Now, this is quite interesting. Actually, the phrase was, have I encountered anyone in the five parts of India, five parts of one country, that does not admire China? So I think he was not in diversity and yet saw a unit. So 11th early, century, 10, 12, I think, AD, certainly very early 11th century, um, the first, uh, first book, really serious book on India, which I think is probably the best book, yet written on India. 
India. Uh, in Al Biruni, yes. the Iranian traveler, what is called Tariq Al Hind, the history of India. That's all happening before Norman Conquest of Britain, I might point out. So there is a sense of Indian identity that is being seen by outsiders. And in fact, the whole term India, of course, is a foreigner's invention. Yes. In the sense that they had to signify it, and they saw Indus as a river, now happens to be mostly in Pakistan. But they defined that whole area as, as India. So I think, in some ways, the, how others see us have been a very important part of the kind of self definition. Yes. This is early multiculturalism yeah. from, the, from the 11th century. Yeah. Um, all right, let me just push it a little further. It seems to me, if you look at the history of, let's say, India before the Mughal Empire, yeah. um, and again, India after, this, after the Great Mughals, at the period which British power has increased, yeah. what you see is dissension. What you see is war. Um, and in fact, one of the ways in which the British were able, as we know, to, to, to develop a hold over India was by renting themselves out in a mercenary way to fight for Prince A against Prince B. Um, and get land in return. So, yeah. uh, isn't, there, isn't, isn't this a little utopian, your notion? Uh, I don't think it's utopian. It depends on what the notion is. If the notion is, was there a modern sense of nationalism on the part of India, I think that would be completely not. wrong. Okay, absolutely not. Was there a lot of dissension? You know, I think there were things like that going on, war, rulers, Crimean War, hundreds of things in Europe and, 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 and within Britain too, and between the Scots and the English and, 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 and so on. That didn't prevent its development of the central of, of, of being British. So I think it's a similar thing to look at. But if you, I think in a sense, I'm not very good that you're focusing on, on the, on the moment. Because I think in some way it basically Akbar, 15, you know, late 16th century, mm -hmm. that marks a kind of definitive view of the identity of India. Because if, well, if you think about what was the project that Akbar had, this is the Muslim emperor, the grandson of Baba who established it, uh, he is trying to get not only unified calendar. In my native India, I discussed 32 major calendars going back to a long time with a lot of shared features. From 4th century AD, there is a principal meridian, uh, median, principal median defined, which runs through Punjab. <coughs> and it's often not recognized, and we will get irritated by India being 10 and a half hours different from here and 5 and a half from Britain. But it is still the same principle meridian. The Indian standard time is the Ujjain time, fixed in 4th century AD. Now the calendar, they agreed on that. But otherwise, the calendar was different, some solar, some lunar. Other type of the unified Indian calendar. You know, it's a, it would be the Tariq el -Hai. Just as he also wanted the unified Indian religion, yes. which would draw on Islam. It didn't cease to be a Muslim. But he draw on Islam, but also other other religion, yes. not only Hinduism, but also Parsis and Jains and Jews, I mean, yeah, all of them. So there is that, but I think what I would emphasize is that that's not happening in backward though. 14th century, Amir Khusra, a great Muslim scholar, very interested in Indian identity, what did the Hindus do and how we can think of, it, of an Indian identity. Um, late 14th, 15th and 16th century, these poets, Kabir, Dadu, Ramdas, Ravidas, Mirabai, these are all talking about a kind of holistic understanding of India. And on top of that, you see, if you think about ruler, the main Muslim kingdom before that, of course, are the Pathans. Now, if the Pathans who did, some of these, again, are often forgotten, especially by Hindu sectarian, that the first, I mean, they were very proud in Bengali, we have some really excellent epic translations of Brahma and Mahabharata. However, they were, they were ordered in the 14th century by the Pathan kings. Yeah. So Pathan king ordered the Muslim kings of Bengal. They were ordering a translation of the Sanskrit epics into, into, into Bengali. And again, there is a kind of focus on 
what unites people as it was by. So I think as long as we are not insisting on modern kind of nationalism, yeah. there's enough of a basis well, of unity there. But like you, I, I do, you know, I, I always admire what uh, Akbar, the so-called grandmother, did in the way of that kind of synthesis, which you also see in the art of the period, uh, attempts to synthesize art from different parts of India and so on. Um, and the, the religion that he invented, which kind of didn't catch up, one has to say, which was the kind of synth synthesis of religions, the so-called Dine Lai. People did say that there was an element of megalomania in this, that, that in, um, in Fatehpur Sikri, his capital city, over the great gate of the Bulan Darwaza, the great gate of Fatehpur Sikri, there is the inscription, Allah Akbar, which of course co conventionally translates as God is great, but by only a small semantic stretch translates as Akbar is God. Um, <laughs> that, that I think is a little unfair. I, I, I really do think it's unfair. It was said by him even at the time. <laughs> um, but yes, it is unfair. But yeah. then, well, it was said by the, by the Delhi Muslim priestly caste. Yes. That yes. basically is what could have History <laughs> has a way of being unfair. Yeah. Um, the, the question I was one of the things I think I wanted to talk to you about is, yeah. which comes out of that, is the way in which the Indian idea of secular differs from the Western idea of secularism in some interesting areas. But to get to that, I just want to say that this is, you know, we're talking about a long time ago. Yeah. And if you look at more recent events in India, sectarian violence has been at the heart, you know, of, of all our lives, you know. And, and in, in your own case, of course, the partition rights were extremely formative. And uh, I do, you tell very movingly the story of, of, a, of an encounter with the victim of violence. Well, I don't know if you killed. But perhaps you'd like to share that with Yeah, well, no, that was, I was, I was in 11. I was 11. I was in, in Dhaka, which was then the second city of Bengal, and now being the later the capital of East Pakistan, now the capital of Bangladesh. So we lived, uh, the, the regions were not entirely separated, but it was a primarily Hindu region in which we lived not far from the university where my father taught, uh, not far from the court where my grandfather used to practice. So I, um, I was playing in the garden when suddenly uh, came in chat, profusely bleeding and obviously being, being slashed by a knife and um, asking for some water and some help. And I, I handled, and again, I was looking after him until like, my shout got my father down my mother down and my father took him to the hospital where he died. But it was a extraordinary thing. I was talking with him. He was actually had his head on my lap while I was uh, while I was drinking water and he was telling me and that was actually quite important for my understanding of, of, of economics and the role of it too. Uh, and that very early days in my I remember thinking when I was thinking about actually the all economics that there was some issue there. That he said that um, his wife had told him not to go out to an unfriendly area, but there was nothing at home to eat. And uh, the, he, there was an offer of a job, and he was on his way there, and he was nearly there, when these thugs uh, stopped him and killed him. And, and the interesting thing, the, the thoughts that it generated were A, that, I mean, all kinds of thoughts. One is the complete incomprehension as to why. Some people will kill this guy whom they have never met before, just because one identity, their different religious identity, was such a dominant thing. Secondly, while in terms of religious classification, that's a very different identity from the from the Hindus there. And yet, if you look at the 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 tally of the victims of Raj, uh, the easiest people to kill are of course the poorest who happen to don't live in sheltered houses, who have to go out to work. So the, the, the biggest victims of Hindu violence were Muslim poor, and the biggest victims of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of the Muslim violence were the Hindu poor. Their class identities were much the same. Their religious identities were extremely different, but the class was not allowed to come. But this whole thing that, that, that the wife had told him, the sensible thing, don't go out in the state, he had to go out because economic necessity. He had to go across. Yeah, this he had to go. So that made me also see how you can't think about freedom at the same time 
thinking about the economic uh, freedom as being a component of it. Well, we're coming uh, circling around to the, to the key subject here, which is the subject of identity and violence. I just wanted to mention, I remember talking about another moment of extreme uh, religious violence uh, in India, the moment in Assam uh, of the so-called Delhi killings, where, yes. when, um, uh, I mean, the, the famous photographs of the massacre children of a particular village which had been raided by their religious enemies, so to speak, from them. And uh, I've never forgotten these photographs that appeared in the Indian press and, and internationally of the bodies of children laid out in, in, in neat rows, um, having been slaughtered um, by, by these marauding villagers. And I remember talking, being in India at the time, and talking to a group of writers, including the great Canada novelist, Ananda Murthy. And, and the thing he said is, which I love about is he said, we must understand that we are all guilty of these murders. That if any Indian is able to do this, then all Indians are capable of it, and therefore the guilt belongs to all of us. That there is, if there is in us that capacity which allows us to kill our neighbors, you know, then it is in all of us. And until we understand that, we understand nothing about what happened. Uh, and I, I mention this because it runs counter to your uh, desire to unify that world and just to point out that the divisions there do run very deep and burst out in these bursts of violence. Yeah, the divisions that run deep and they don't. Uh, you know, if you think about the Hindu Muslim environment itself, the 14th that I'm describing, they came with the suddenness of a storm and then they disappeared. Bear in mind that the Hindu Muslim violence was not standard feature of the world at all. But the storm is coming back, and the storm comes back. And well, the storm comes, comes back, back, and that's why I think eternal vigilance is not the price only of liberty, but of other things too. But you see, bear in mind that you know this breaks up. I'm talking about 44, what I was telling you about earlier. But it's at that time, two or three years old, that the violent 47 India is partitioned. By 1951, the city of Dhaka, not only there have been no killing since then, but also they are completely different issues. Now a Bengali nationalism, wanting separation, bad treatment of Bengalis in Pakistan, that becomes the issue. And the streets are full of agitation about the different cause, mm -hmm. the cause of, of, of Bengali literature, culture, and so on. So I think the depth of it, you see, if you think it to be really so deep that it cannot be moved, it would be difficult to think of it. I mean, there obviously was an irresistible force that did move that object at some stage within three years. And that, that's the extraordinary thing. So I think the, the, the important thing here, I would argue, is that when it happens, that absolutely seizes you. It, whether it's Hutus and Tutsis, or whether it's Serbs and Albanians, whether, and for it's gone on for a long time, Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, it may drown every other kind of identity. And yet, when it's gone, you may wonder what the hell was that about? So I, I, I don't see them as powerful. We make them more powerful by assuming them to be so deep, so ingrained in human nature. And the subtitle of my book is The Illusion of Destiny. And I do want to emphasize that. And I think Patro, not in this me, that might have become the title of the book too. But you know, the not to be they were right. They were right. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> they were right. They were right. They were right. But this imaginary thesis is that what we take to be destiny is not only a delusion, but actually that illusion. Illusion has an absolutely terrible effect because it, it makes people paralyzed from action, they will take it for granted. And then you see one of the things that's happened now. It gets this clash of civilization that the Hindus and Muslims and Muslims and Christians must be at loggerheads with each other. Into the clash of civilization, the, the defense comes not saying, well, Muslims and Hindus and Christians have many other identities too, as like scientists, as, as uh, you know, people liking literature, etc. Instead of that, there becomes a new program. Yes, they is one identity seriously, but now you have amity between civilizations. Dialogue among civilization. You first reduce human beings into one miniaturized form, member of civilization, doesn't matter anything else. Then, anarchy, not that. Well, that's, so that's I think this, this brings us to your book. 
there's, I just wanted to, to, to let people hear, that there's, a, there's a passage in the book which, which gives a good exposition of this idea about how many things we can be and what it means. So would, you, would you like to read this for a few minutes? Yeah. I have to make clear that my own book is not my favorite reading. <laughs> Always, but when I'm commanded to do that, I yes. do that. Yes, good boy. Read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a chapter called Making Sense of Identity. A history and background are not the only way of seeing ourselves and the groups to which we belong. There are a great variety of categories to which we simultaneously belong. I can be at the same time, and I've said this all biographically a bit, same time an Asian, an Indian citizen, a Bengali with Bangladeshi ancestry, an American of British resident, an economist, a dabbler in philosophy, an author, a Sanskritist, a strong believer in secularism and democracy, a man, a feminist, a heterosexual, a defender of gay and lesbian rights, with a non-religious lifestyle from a Hindu background, a non-Brahmin, and a non-believer in an afterlife, and also, in case the question is asked, a non-believer in before life as well. <laughs> this is just a small sample of diverse categories, to each of which I may simultaneously belong. There are, of course, a great many other membership cat categories too, which, depending on circumstances, can move and engage me. Belonging to each one of the membership groups can be quite important, depending on the particular context. When they compete for attention and priority over each other, they need not always, since there may be no conflict between the demands of different loyalties, but when they do, the person has to decide on the relative importance to attach to the respective identities, which will again depend on the exact context. There are two distinct issues here. First, the recognition that identities are robustly plural and that the importance of one identity need not obliterate the importance of others. Second, a person has to make choices, explicitly or by implication, about what relative importance to attach in a particular context to the divergent loyalty, loyalties and priorities that may compete for precedence. Identifying with others in various different ways can be extremely important for living in a society. It has not, however, always been easy to persuade social analysts to accommodate identity in a satisfactory way. In particular, two different types of reductionism seem to abound in the formal literature of social and economic analysis. One may be called identity disregard, and it takes the form of ignoring or neglecting altogether the influence of any sense of identity with others on what we value and how we behave. For example, a good deal of contemporary economic, economic theory proceeds as if in choosing their aims, objectives, and priorities, people do not have or pay attention to any sense of identity with anyone other than themselves. John Donne may have warned, no man is an island entire of itself, but the postulated human beings of pure economic theory are often made to see themselves as pretty entire. In contrast, the identity, in contrast with identity disregard, there is a different kind of reductionism, which we may call singular affiliation, which takes the form of assuming that any person preeminently belongs, for all practical purposes, to one collectivity only, no more and no less. Of course, we do know, in fact, that any real human being belongs to many different groups through birth, associations, and alliances. Each of these group identities can, and sometimes does, give the person a sense of affiliation and loyalty. Despite that, the assumption of singular aff affiliation is amazingly popular, if only implicitly, among several groups of social theorists. It seems to appeal often enough to communitarian thinkers, as well as to those theorists of cultural politics 
who like to divide up the world population into civilizational categories. The intricacies of plural groups and multiple loyalties are obliterated by seeing each person as firmly embedded in exactly one affiliation, replacing the richness of leading an abandoned human life with the formulaic narrowness of insisting that any person is quote-unquote situated in just one organic fact. To be sure, the assumption of singularity is not only the staple nourishment of many theories of identity, it is also, as I discussed in the first chapter, a frequently used weapon of sectarian activists who want the targeted people to ignore altogether all other linkages they could, uh, that could moderate their loyalty to that specially marked herd. The incitement to ignore all affiliation and loyalties other than those emanating from one restrictive identity can be deeply delusive and also contribute to social tension and ultimately violence. Well, that's, I think that passage does, in a way, is what you explore throughout, throughout yeah. the book. And, and let me just start out by saying what I agree with. Paul would be disappointed if you stop there. No, no, of course not. <laughs> we will not stop there. Yeah. But we will start there. Yeah. And it seems to me that as a novelist, one of the things that has been always clear to me is that unlike novelists in, let's say, the pre-Freudian age, who believed in character as something unitary, you know, a person was what he was, and in the immortal, you know, the immortal words of Popeye the same man, um, you know, I am what I am, and that's what I am. <laughs> um, well, it seems to me that Popeye had not read Freud. <laughs> um, just a theory. <laughs> um, otherwise, he would know that, in fact, we are much more fractured than that, and that, and that uh, as selves, we are very, we are a kind of bag of selves, and we contradict ourselves. And, you know, put it, to put it simply, the way in which we are with our parents is not the way in which we are with our children. Uh, the way we behave with our employers is not the way we behave with our lovers. Uh, the way we behave towards our friends is not the way we behave towards people we don't like. You know, we have, all of us, a whole series of behaviors uh, which, which different groups of people would perceive as ourselves. Um, and yet might, in fact, be very different. You might be a very aggressive employer, but a very timid husband, for example. Um, and yet, that would all be you. you know? so, so I think, in, in that sense, it, it, it's quite clear that we do, as you say, uh, cover a lot of different, or contain within ourselves, elements of different, to use mathematical terms, set. You know, and it seems to me that your theory is not unlike, in some ways, mathematical set theory. You know? um, and, and you can draw these circles and see how many circles we all belong in. Um, the problem is, you talk about a great deal when you, when you go on from this, about the, and you, it was in that passage too, um, about the importance of choice. You say that basically what we all need to do and do do uh, is to choose the relative weight that we impart to our different identities. I mean, in theory, it would be possible to meet an Islamic radical who was a Yankees fan. <laughs> and therefore, even though you might oppose his Islamic radicalism, you would have Yankee fandom in common unless, unless you were a Mets fan, in which case, in which case bad luck. <laughs> Not this year. Anyway. Um, however, given that we do all, you say, need to make these choices, and we do make these choices, of, of, of the way to it. I just want to just question how much of this choice making is free choice. Because all kinds of things weigh on us, including peer group pressure, um, including the way in which we are perceived by others and describe us to ourselves, and it's sometimes very hard to escape from that description. Um, given that we don't come naked into the world, we come into the world, you know, we are conditioned to an extent by our upbringing. 
Um, and that conditioning makes it harder to make the free choice. And so, isn't this question of choosing uh, really, in fact, quite a limited thing? And I want to just, to, 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 is it, for example, would you say only a privileged group who are able to make such choices? Is it class-based, for example? Is it only a very highly educated elite class that can make such choices? I mean, is it excessive to believe that as human beings we can all make such choices? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think I, if, if you take it as a rhetorical question, then I disagree with it. Um, namely, that I think the ability to think of ourselves in these plural terms is a very generic ability. It's probably almost as wide as what Chomsky discusses our ability to understand syntax and language. The, if you look at the history of it, I mean, some of the people I've discussed are, are privileged people. Ashoka in 3rd century BC, an emperor. Uh, Akbar is another emperor, and so on. And, uh, and theorists like Abu Fadl or, 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 or Kamil Kusha, obviously intellectuals, Gandhi to go. And yet, quite a lot of the movements have come with go against sectarian identity react. If you look actually look at the history of Arab, it's very interesting in some ways. The beginnings of it include intellectuals, both Muslim and Hindus. Amir Kusar is probably the biggest name in 14th century. 14, 15, 16, who are these poets I was referring to? These are very common people. Kabir is a weaver, Dadu is a cotton carder, Ravi Das is a cobbler. These are initially folk songs arguing um, against the division between Hindus and Muslims being taken to be more serious than it is. It's also religious poetry, and yes, they are also uh, community-based poetry. Now, that becomes a very strong movement around the area. Now, there is an apocryphal, possibly we don't know, story that Akbar had a 40-day meeting with one of them, Dadu, who was born a Muslim, Cotton Kada, and became one of those things and started a group called Brahma Sampradha, which you can clearly indicate that he was crossing also various boundaries. So, and well before Akbar himself had these major Agra discussions, at the time, I came a bit of a religion, and at the time, if I may say with some pride, exactly at the time when these discussions were going, going on, Giordano Bruno was burnt at the stake in, in Rome, come to be a theory to be exact for apostasy. So at that visionary moment, preceding that, he had already had conversation with the cotton carter coming and lecturing him. And it's too, you may think that by Allah Akbar he was praising himself, but a guy who was ready to listen to a cotton carter, a successful poet having something to say, asking him what the hell do you want to say. And so I, I think this is raised again and again. And just one of the things I should mention, um, uh, the, actually my, my grandfather had a book on Hinduism, which was, I translated in uh, 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, he discusses how the, 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 the question of uh, amity has often come in, in the different communities from very common people. But it is true even today, there's not a single one of the riots that I can think of that have rural origin. They're basically urban phenomena. They're disgruntled urban. I think Marx would have called them London proletariat is often the canon fodder of the pedestrians who are, uh, the, 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 the foot soldiers who are recruited to that. But they're always theory taught off. I mean, the, the, the Hindu Tibet violence to which you refer in Gujarat and other, you can trace into the ideas theorists, Sabarka and others, uh, and not to rural thought. There's not a single one that actually originated in, in the rural area. That was Sweden in the 1940s. They're generated in the city. So I think in some ways the lower classes get a bad press in this. I don't think it is the case that it's a privilege of the, uh, of the, uh, of the elite to, uh, to think in these terms. 
When the last election was going on, 2004, I think, the general election, it was a very important one because the first general election after the Gujarat riots and, and actually the, 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 the party most implicated did lose office. But I remember traveling around in the Gaul in a, 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 a trust group which does some work on schools and, and hospitals. And I remember talking with a person, very poor, possibly illiterate, and I asked him what he was, how was he viewing the election. He said, well, I hope we do speak up. We were discussing exactly that issue. And then I said, well, do you think we will? And he said, you know, I ought to tell you that it, it, it's not very hard to silence us. Mm. But that's not because we cannot speak. I think the distinction he was making that it is not an intergenerational inability to understand these issues and speak up. If we don't speak up, it's because we are afraid, we are cowed down by others, either by propaganda, by the architects of violence, or by state machinery. Well, that's just the point, yeah. is, that, is that if there are such pressures as fear would be. Uh, to, to what extent can we make these choices? Well, that is their role. I, mean, I know that you play that role, and I think you have been taking a very, very similar view of, of, of the, you know, Muslim is a Muslim, and, you know, they, they will kill us, or, or you know, or, or it's our duty to kill them. And, and, and I think we have to speak up and, you know, talk about the variety of identities that we have. As in, uh, uh, as intellectuals and you know, as knowledge of being one. And yet, a lot of the leadership have, would have come from, from what, the, what you hear people talk about in the streets of Calcutta. You're too much of a Bombay Walla to <laughs> recognize what are the most things that are talked about as you walk around in Calcutta. Maybe in Bombay. Well, I understand that yeah. between these cities there's entirely healthy mutual contempt. <laughs> <laughs> At least in Bombay, the sidewalks don't have ten foot holes in them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, that's a <laughs> side. I have, to, I, have to, I have to do a retaliation from a Bengali, actually. I <laughs> adopted Bengali. Uh, my friend, um, um, Salma Sabah, telling me that she was very upset, like I was, and Bombay renamed itself and called itself Mumbai. Yes. And I we we thought it was ridiculous. And someone said, you know, Master, when you think about it, it's not a bad effort on the part of someone trying to say Bombay while looking for his denture. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that we could go down this side road for quite a long time. <laughs> Maybe we should not. Um, uh, just to, just to drag us back. Of course, side roads in Calcutta, they're all side roads. <laughs> <laughs> there are no main roads. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, the question in your again in the piece you read about singularity and about the, uh, what, what you I clearly would describe, I think, as being an error to, to, to allow oneself to be put into just one box, you know, whether that's a box of, of religion or race or class or nation or tribe or whatever it may be, but that, that, uh, that singularity you could describe as, as, as a kind of error, yeah. so, uh, a kind of error of self-description. Yeah, it's yeah. its main problem is it's an epistemic failure first, before it becomes an ethical failure too. But what happens? Let's take the example, for example, for just to, as, a, as, a, as an instance of the July bombers in England. Uh, what happens if that singularity error is the choice made by the individual? What, what happens if you're, you're saying that we must make choices about the weight we give to our different identities? What if the choice we make is that only one of our identities matters? And that only one of our identities is relevant or truthful or powerful or necessary to, to, as, as a basis for action. If that is the free choice made by the, by the individual, which you say the individual should make, to reject pluralism, to become singular, and, and the consequence of that is an event like that, an event like a, a, a suicide bomb. Um, I mean, you can't, if, you, if, you're in, if you are advocating free choice, then that must be something that you would have to respect, rather than calling it, is that a mistake, is what I'm saying? Or is well, it a choice? I, yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think, I think we're pushed in different directions. And I think the July 7 
bombing. I was actually in London on that day. In fact, I had gone in the same direction as Piccadilly. I was in catching a Heathrow plane to go to Frankfurt that day. Uh, and this happened a little later uh, when, the, when the Piccadilly line uh, was blown up and, and the buses and so on. Now, if you look at it, there are really several distinct things to look at here. The worrying thing, of course, that shook the British, that these were British born, Britain reared, educated, uh, you know, the, in Britain, children who grow up to, to have that sense of dissonance with the British community. On one side, there is the pressure from Islamic terrorism and, and you know, recruiting them. And actually, one of the things that overlooked now that the, the warm memory of the empire is making such a comeback in everywhere, how much of the legacy of empire, the sense of, the sense of having been badly treated when the, when the European powers could divide Middle East or Africa as they like, just draw a line and, and the countries will be different countries. How much of that the Islamic terrorists really draw on? So there is that. I mean, on top of that, of course, there is homegrown dogmatism on the, on the Islamic side. And yet, if you look at the other side of it, what is the British policy doing? The British were very visionary in many ways. In, in, unlike the French, had, uh, you know, by and large, all colored people resident in Britain have a vote because coming from Commonwealth, a subject of the Queen without British citizenship, the vote, I vote in Britain. And that immediately gives me a sense of identity. That was very well done, the pension, the National Health Service, uh, far less discriminatory if I'm any judge compared to the French. And yet, they also decided at that time, and I think that was high theory, that the best way of looking at multiculturalism is this plural monoculturalism stuff. So that for the sake of a mechanical parity, the, just that there were Christian schools paid for by the government, there would be Muslim schools, the Hindu schools, Sikh schools. Not just that these schools, I mean, they're, they're coming up very fast, but their evil effect we will see in the future. But that mentality that led to that line of thinking. I mean, I'm a great believer that British identity is a very important thing uh, for people to pursue at that time, without denying any other kind of identity. You, know, you may be a Muslim, you may be Hindu, you may be a Labour Party or maybe something else, but this unique identity of being a British Muslim, this became a big thing. I was absolutely horrified as I was catching my plane to hear the government appealing the British Muslim community to get its act together. That's an invitation to British Muslims not to act as British citizens in the civil society. The comprehensive undermining of which is one of the problems we see everywhere from, the, from, from Europe and America to Iran. But this is a kind of deliberate undermining of it, asking people to act within the religious community. Go and meet your Imams and tell them to be moderate rather than extremist. That's the line. I would be called up by a Bangladeshi friend. And he said, I just heard the Prime Minister uh, appealing to me not to act as a member of the Labour Party, <laughs> not to act as a member of the Transport and General Workers Union, but as a Muslim. And I must go and visit the local Imam whom I've never visited. Because, <laughs> because I'm a British Muslim and it is my job to get him to be moderate. Yeah. Now, I think this whole discourse plays I think it's devastating. Oh, but, but I agree with you. I think on the subject of the pathetic Blair government, I don't think I don't think we'd have any disagreement. But I, what I what I'm asking you to to yeah. accept is that these boys. Oh, I have to tell you. I don't know. I, I think it should be more widely known that the, the joke that entered the internet within 24 hours of the of the July bombings was uh, two British Muslims go into a sporting goods store. And try on rucksacks, and 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 Muhammad says to Abdullah, "Does my bomb look big in this?" Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was actually very healthy that the humour began within 24 hours of that event. It's a very British reaction, in many ways, to that event. But the fact is that these boys decided to strip away from themselves all their other available identities. You know, their, their identities as that were like British, as the children of their parents, as the brothers of their siblings, um, as you know, cricket players. One of them certainly had some talent in that department. Um, 
you know, whatever other selves they decided, they, they chose to be this self, you know. Um, and I'm not sure that you could explain that away entirely by outside pressure on them, because no. one of the things we now, even the British police are saying, is that they didn't seem to have any real links to Al-Qaeda, and they seem to get all this stuff off the internet. Um, what, would you, what, would you say, what would you say to those people if you had the chance? If you were up there with the 72 virgins? Uh, or, or as we now know, raisins. Yeah. <laughs> the mistranslation from the Aramaic. Yeah. <laughs> that was, yeah. My Aramaic is a bit rusty, so I don't know. This is, I must say, it's the, the, the old, one of the very few reasons I can think of for believing in an afterlife. Yeah. is to see the look on the faces of people arriving to, with, with an expectation of virgins and being offered a bowl of dried fruit. <laughs> I don't think, I, I don't think the, I don't think the virgins play a very big part in, in this kind of Bible that you're looking at. I don't think whatever these four um, Pakistani origin Muslim boys, but British citizens, were doing, I don't think they were looking for virgins. I think they were looking for a sense of or they see as a justice. And they take it. I think that actually, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because I'd like to turn it around and say that that's what makes the identity show so important. Mm -hmm. That it was strongly instilled on them that it's true they have a British identity, but you know, the British are doing pretty well. Look at the unfortunate creature in the world, the Muslims all around the world. For a, minute, for a thousand years, they might have been the strongest power. But, my God, they're absolutely nowhere. They can, Europeans and the Westerners can do what they like with them. And we ought to change that situation. So there is a strong sense of commitment. So much of the, so much of the terrible things happen along with a mood of self-sacrifice. They were self-sacrificing people. I don't think they're looking for virgin primarily. I think they are looking for doing something which they think is the just thing to do. And that's exactly why civil society is important, and that's exactly why the multiplicity of identities and the fact that their demand for identities are so important. You know, I think there have been, you see, at the moment, if you think about it, the global movement about the only non-religious, non, say, Islamic terrorism, but there were others too, like, uh, you know, Hindu through the world movement too, the wish for Hindu Parishad in the world movement. The Sikhs have been world movement also. Um, the, but but they are world, 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 world movements in the sense that based the World Series is the World Series. Well, that may apply to the that may apply to the to the Hindus and the Sikhs, yeah. but the Islamic is much much wider. But I think the only uh, opposite group, of course, are things like anti globalization people. I think the odd thing are the two things. The pro-globalization, as it were, capital, world capitalism is a great unifier. Mm -hmm. Business is the point that David Hume noted that as you do business with others, you come to know about their existence. You can hardly overlook the fact that they exist. Mm -hmm. And similarly, anti-globalization people, these are not local boys of Genoa and Seattle. They come from everywhere, from Adelaide, to Kuala Lumpur, so they to come over there. They are, they are a different globalist. kind of identity. globalist. They are. And the globalization movement is the, is the biggest globalized movement in the world today. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and that's to their credit. And I think even those who don't like their economic rhetoric should see that they provide an alternative way of thinking about one's global identity. So I think there are all kinds of other things happening. It's just that what the singularity thesis does is to reduce everything to non-existent, you mm -hmm. know. And I think this is what I think the clash of civilization, or for that matter, the amity of civilization theories try to do. All right, and good. I'm glad you got there because now we can come to some of the people who don't like what you say. Yeah. <laughs> and essentially, you're offering this worldview, the worldview of, of the pluralism of self, the pluralism of identity, and the importance of recognizing and fostering that. Right? Uh, to, to, to simplify his argument, he says that that is there's, that there is no momentum behind that idea. That this 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 uh, what you call miniaturization, uh, the, the 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 singularization of identity, is actually where all the momentum is right now. 
Um, that's actually what's happening in the world, you know, rather than what one might wish to happen in the world. That's in fact what is happening in the world. And given that, that the Huntington thesis, the Clash of Civilizations thesis, is a much more persuasive description of the world we live in than yours. And that, I mean, I don't think he uses the term, but the your, he, it strongly suggests that yours would be a kind of wishy-washy liberalism, whereas that's the kind of tough truth, you know? Um, what do you think of that? <laughs> uh, not much, no. <laughs> I don't know the gentleman in question. Fuori Jami. Fuori Jami. I don't know my own. He's a well known guy, I guess. Um, well, he knows himself anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think I agree with that. You know, I think you will find it greatly difficult to explain many things that's happening today. Even in Britain, it's a very small, small faction of the population has acted the way, even of the Muslim population in Britain has acted the way that the July 7 bomber did, very tiny fraction. Um, and across the world, everywhere you see that. It's just that that's inflated, and there's an attempt to pump it up. And if, in addition to Islamic terrorists pumping it up, if Western parochialists is to join hands to pump it up, I have reason to protest. It's not because they're winning anyway, and I don't think they can win anyway up eventually. But it's not the way the world is. I think India. We, it's a country of. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. When you say it's not the way the world is, it is the way the world is. No, I'm not. I mean, it's the way the world is in the sense that it's the way some people think the world is. And that's a feature of the world that these are, you know, people don't often recognize how special their own position is. Can I tell you a story on that? Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> One of my favorite stories, which is also connected with that, I think it's probably figures in the book somewhere. This is about the difficulty about people not, not understanding how others see them. And this is a story from Italy. My late wife is Italian, Italian Jewish ancestry. And she um, died a lot of, of illness. Her father was killed by Mussolini, by the fascists. But this is from the time when the fascist party in the 1920s was making great inroads. In, in the rural areas in Italy, they were burned to. They're doing propaganda and asking people to join the fascist party. And there's an Italian rural simpleton called this fascist recruiter gets sold up. And he explains why he should join the fascist party. And this guy said, well, I can't join the fascist party. Um, it's impossible because I'm a socialist. My father was a socialist. My grandfather was a socialist. My great grandfather was a socialist. I cannot possibly join the fascist party. To which this person said, This is an extremely silly argument if you think about it. Imagine if you were, if your father was a murderer, if your grandfather was a murderer, if your great grandfather was a murderer, then what would you have done then? To which he said, Then of course I would have joined the fascist party. <laughs> is that if he is viewing India the way he thinks the world is, yes. how do you think? I mean, we have, I mean, we have an ups and downs, we have an out here of rights and, and people that fought it. It's a big issue. Bangladesh is a big issue going on right now. Now, in India, we have 82% of the population is Hindu. If you look at the three principal positions of government, the president of the country is Abdul Kalam, a Muslim, the prime minister is Manmohan Singh, a Sikh, the leader of the ruling party is Sonia Gandhi, a Christian born in Italy. And there would be no way that in, I shouldn't say throughout the world because I don't know him other than this review, that in this world that you could imagine this be possible. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that happened in Pakistan, I mean, Bangladesh's separation from Pakistan was not on grounds of religion, not on grounds of literature, culture, as well as secularism. If you look at Pakistan, one of the biggest things that happened in the subcontinent over the last 10 years is the emergence of an independent and largely secular press. The powerful papers, uh, the Dawn, the Daily Times, the News, the Nation. Which, which all of which used to be official mouthpieces. Yeah, yeah. they all changed. Mm -hmm. And if I think about my, one of my great gurus, a great Urdu poet, you, you knew, yeah. 
Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who was one of the early leaders of, of, uh, of, of Pakistani thought and Pakistan, it was a Pakistani time, he was arrested and he eventually died. And that, he would have been absolutely delighted. This is what he was trying to do in the 50s and 60s. But this has happened in Pakistan. And it's, it's, I mean, to ignore all that as if not to exist. And I can understand, I'm shocked, of course, that every time the leader of, of, from Britain or America visit, they would never visit a member of the civil society. They would confine themselves to well, political well, leaders and military leaders. And in the case of convenient day in Pakistan, they are the same. So that it, they don't have to travel very far to see them all. On the other hand, I wish they would spend day, I mean, the undermining of civil society, which is taking such a hard toll in Iraq. Is, is something also cultivated by ignoring altogether everything else. And the poor government way of looking at it, I shouldn't say that, I'm different way of looking at it, pushes that in the direction of forgetting everything else, just that one way of looking at war. Anyway, yeah, well, this, this question of whether are you, are you soft on Islam? And if so, why? I don't think I am. I think, I think Islamic terrorism is causing a tremendous amount of uh, vast nastiness and violence in the world today. But, you know, I think where my disagreement is, is to see in the history of Muslim people, which is not the same thing as Islamic history, nothing other than that. I mean, one of the oddities, I mean, what he's referring to here, for example, I was mentioning the back, that um, when an American mathematician today does an algorithm, he may or may not recognize he or she that is, the, is, is common, he or she is commemorating the memory of a Muslim mathematician in the 9th century called Al Karazmi, from whose name Al Ghazim comes, and from whose Arabic book Al Jabbar Al Mukabila comes to turn algebra. Now, so I think what this guy is saying, he's saying, yes, but why did it die out? Because mm -hmm. uh, it's true that every time people praise the great achievements of Islam, they all happen to be not necessarily. Okay. But I would say, but I, I, there is another take on that, in addition to the one you're making, that the, that the, um, it, the, the, it's wrong to think of them as achievements of religion as such. It's certainly true that Islam gave a kind of a, 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 a political unity, which made this possible, with a very liberal kind of flowering of the society possible. Uh, but it's also true that these were, it would be wrong to think of al Turazmi as an Islamic author. He is not. Indeed, not only in my complaint is, not only in British schools of Christian variety is al Turazmi anything about him mentioned, but in the newly found Blair's Islamic school, they're not taught, taught either, because that's a part of Muslim history, not a part of Islamic history. Now, I think the, the question is that it's been overwhelmed, and I think in this day, empire did play a part, and so if, if the, if people don't recognize what kind of forces generated, I mean, if, 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 if Muslim violence is fed by that one, so I tried to argue the argument in India, how James Mill's vision of India directly feeds into the Hindu the extremism that we see today. So I think there's a kind of direct relationship there. But that's not to, in any way, to overlook what terrible things are done in the name of Islamic uh, you know, fundamentalism today. I, I agree with my friend Mamdani's thesis that fundamentalism is not the same thing as terrorism. But in translating that, yes, there is a propaganda going on. But rather than saying we blame them all, we have to see what is the way to intervene. I mean, the, the so-called war on terror is going on without engaging civil society anywhere starting with elections without any kind of discussion when media is completely uh, KY in, in Iran. I mean, when all that's going on, to pursue that ideological issue rather than the political issue of our different identity and that we can interact again, you know, we have a, you know, if you have a decent media, if you have a unions, if you have uh, occupational groups, etc., it would take a very different form. You know, I think the history of it, Fuad also raised this question, looking back historically, in that review. Uh, and I think one of my critics in the Wall Street Journal did too, there are several letters published on that, uh, that one uh, said that I referred to the fact that the Jewish uh, philosopher Maimonides, when he had difficulty in Spain, he went to Cairo. Now, 
it was so that we think that this is a telling point against me to say that the difficulty he had in Spain came from Islamic yeah. rulers. Now, that's true. That I could never deny. Uh, there was a change. I mean, ninth century Caliph Abdul Rahman with the Jewish uh, vizier Sakut did some of the finest multicultural work in ninth century world in the world. But 11th century, uh, uh, 12th century is changed. But the interesting point is, where did he go? He did not go to Britain. He didn't go to France or Germany. Richard the Lionheart was fighting the Crusades against Saladin. Maimonides didn't go to Richard the Lionheart. He went to Saladin and was given a position in his court. We give a court doctor and a high-ranking official there. So I think it's my point isn't that there isn't a lot of skeletons in that cupboard. Mm. But I think when Western parochialists say that in the history of Muslims there is nothing other than intolerance, yes. that is, I mean, as you pointed out earlier, that, 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 I want to emphasize that, that to start with an epistemic failure, a, a complete confusion about the nature of history about that period, and then it also generates an ethical and a political failure today. Yeah. If I can just bring you forward 900 years, <laughs> um, um, just for, as a last question before we ask yeah. the audience to, to intervene, if this is your desirable goal, the, the, the fact that we should shed singularity of identity, that we should resist miniaturization of the self, um, and that we should seek to comprehend ourselves as broadly based multiple identities with much more in common with each other than we might otherwise suspect. In a moment in the history of the world when we seem to be going the other way, when we seem to be uh, more and more defining ourselves narrowly, whether that's, you know, so Croat, Bosnian, whether it's, whether it's India, Pakistan, whether it's whether it's the West against Islam, whatever, you know, whatever it may be, we do seem to be going in the other direction. Okay? So the question then is, how do we reverse that trend and how do we get where you how do we begin to get where you want us to go? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 I well I think I would seek you I mean, without denying the importance of the question and the practical reason, what should we do? There's also, I'm not sure I acknowledge that we're moving in the opposite direction. There are many different things happening. There are very vocal people and very violent people, in fact, on both sides, which are pursuing one type of call. But other things happen. I was very privileged for three years to be president of the Walk Time. And the number of, of thousands of people, volunteers from different countries, going to incredibly difficult places. Uh, it's amazing, actually, as to how much sacrifice they would make. And suddenly I found myself, I, I remember this group that was start, started by Ted Turner and Sam Nunn called Nuclear Threat Initiative. One of our meetings was taking place when the Afghan operation began. And suddenly I found I was sitting among people in Washington who were extremely well informed, extremely well connected, but I knew more about it because I was still the president of Oxford. Because that morning I had a phone call, and there were 18 of our people in Oxford, in Afghanistan. And I had more information on that. In, from the nature of the information, it's quite clear how precarious they were. But there they were, and there, as you know, actually, they went on fighting. Happily, we didn't lose anybody in Afghanistan. We did lose somewhere else. But at that time, they were trying to carry out relief operation to people not of the same color, not of the same religion, don't share anything other than a, a, a broad identity of human beings, which became a big one, which is a very big factor in that. And that's all happening, and anti-globalization movement, I mentioned, it's just one of them. And there are, there are also even there's a different face of religion, I think missionary activities are often being very concerned with educated people, sometimes of course specializing, but at the same time also there's a big general general trust on education, which we should not deny, as in some ways, some of the uh, Hindu Tabu, anti-Christian Hindu Tabu, have tried to misportray them. I think there have been globalized movements of a really important kind, and they continue today. I think, therefore, I will reformulate the question, what can we do to strengthen it? Now, there, I think, 
I do believe in, uh, uh, that clarity is a great enemy uh, of, of sectarianism. I do believe that. There's a peculiar passage in Wittgenstein, which is actually difficult to interpret. I know there's some distinguished philosophers here in the audience that might be able to weigh you. I think they, I quote it from memory saying, I sometimes wish I was a better person, i.e. more informed and intelligent. Now, you don't think that being informed and intelligent is necessarily make you a good person, but I think there's a point that we refer to there, there's a connection that we draw, that a lot of our nastiness comes from inability to understand lack of clarity and so on. So that's the direction I would like to go. That's a very fun answer for a writer to give. <laughs> Read me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to, we've got about, uh, I guess, 20 the sentence with a question mark. Uh, and um, if we could do that, that would be great because then we won't be wasting time. I don't see. Is there a microphone over there? Two. Two on each side. Well, anybody who'd like to ask a question can do so now, otherwise we'll sit here and talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> yes. Hey. Oh. Yeah, you, you, you cite India as an example in all this having multiple identities. But there's a strong sociological argument that India is an odd example because because the peculiar nature of the Hindu religion, since it's a polytheistic religion, and it believes in multiple gods. Therefore, as a country, it's, it's, it's very comfortable with having multiple religions. Whereas Islam and Christianity are monotheistic religions, and therefore the oddity arises. So I don't know whether how strong is India as an example of having multiple identities yeah, living. Yeah, yeah, your question is, is this correct? The question is... Uh... <laughs> The question is whether polytheism, a polytheistic yeah, no, culture like India, is a yeah. good example when faced with monotheistic conflicts. Yeah. Uh, let me take you out of that terrain of polytheism versus monotheism to say that the first strong articulation in India of tolerance of different point of view comes from a Buddhist emperor called Ashoka, uh, third century BC, and as you probably know. Buddhism is an agnostic religion, so that is a non-theistic religion. There is no God at all. If I put that way, moving past it, we will never settle the question A and B. Um, none of our moral decisions hinge on the existence of God. Indeed, if it did, that would be a self-interested argument, better treatment in the future, rather than a moral argument. Now, so Ashoka was the first one to state that, and if you think about the two principal theories of religious tolerance in India. One is a Buddhist, namely Ashoka, and one is a Muslim, namely Akbar. So that would go a certain amount against uh, saying that it's the peculiar nature of Hinduism that makes that possible. And I do agree that Hinduism, not so much because the multiplicity of gods, I'm not sure what it, what it does uh, for this issue, but the fact that there are different uh, sections of Hinduism and that there are books written and again and again. The fact that in the Vedas, for example, book 1500 BC, uh, there is, I think, probably the first strongly articulated verse about agnosticism, saying, is there a God? Did he make the world? It, it's called the Song of Creation, by the way. I think book 10, if you want to check it out. Uh, did he create it? If he created it, is it still here? If he created it and still here, does he remember it? And so on. And it ends by saying, perhaps it does. And the final line says, perhaps it does not. <laughs> and, and I think that, that is the article. That's got nothing to do with mon uh, uh, polytheism. In fact, that is a monotheistic verse about a singular creation of, by one God. So I think, the, I think the variety of religious experiences is important. But I think the variety of religious experiences, not only within Hinduism, but India generally is quite important. I agree that, that you know, in some ways we're very lucky. We have Christians from both century, Jews from the first centuries, since the, from the fall of Jerusalem, after the, shortly after the fall of Jerusalem. We have had uh, Muslim traders from seventh century onwards. Parsi started coming from the eighth century. Um, 
and, and so on. So we have a Sikhism originated in India, you added the Buddhism. So we have had this variety, and that helped. But you know, in some ways, that kind of multiplicity of point of view is something which has been generated in different forms, not perhaps with so many historical examples elsewhere too. If you look at a book like, say, Nelson Mandela, if you think of the one, I would say, a book, if I had the book today, who is the greatest political leader of, 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 the, of the present time, I would say Nelson Mandela. Now, if you look at a book, his autobiography, uh, Long Walk to Freedom, where does he think he learns about democracy? He first defines democracy in the way that I was trying to argue earlier, democracy is governed by discussion. But then he says, How, where did I learn it? Not in Pretoria, not anywhere else. He learned it, he says, in, his, in the Regent's House regular meeting in his tribal town. Because their people spoke. They didn't have all one vote, but they all spoke. And everyone had a right to speak, no matter how lowly or highly they were. So I think that's history of heritage, and people like him, you know, the people dispute it, but anthropologists like Maya Fortis and others have tried to argue why there is a long-running democratic tradition in Africa of consultation and so forth. So I think it would be wrong of India just because, you know, being verbose also means we have an enormous amount of these examples that people remember and carry on and, and you know, there's an enormous story going on there, the memory has been a big thing. I gather there is a problem, I shouldn't put my foot into it, but there is a debate going on about an Indian author, about whether she might have plagiarized or not. And she said that she had such fantastic memories, she remembers them. But I think I can believe it, because there were, all the, there were a lot of people no, I know who actually knew the Vedas, which is just a massive document, by heart. It's just massive. I think, uh, remembering is one thing, copying it out into your book. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't know that, to be fair to her, we don't know that she actually copied You are very, very, very generous. <laughs> uh, just on the subject of verbose, how about those shorter answers? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just have a question. I, I think it's very helpful for us sitting here to think about ourselves in terms of having a multiplicity of identities. Um, but just getting back to what you were saying earlier about the relationship between economic disempowerment and sort of ethnic conflict, how, how does that translate? How does thinking about ourselves from a very academic perspective in this way translate into trying to build peace at, in places where many of the people who are conflicting, a lot of it is coming from, I think, a place of economic disempowerment. And so you they cling to this identity. Okay. The sound is quite bad for me. Maybe it's my problem. But you were saying the economic environment. Is that right. I think that when people are economically disempowered, they cling to these identities in a stronger way than maybe you or I would. Yeah. So how do we trans how do we translate that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think the main thing there, it's a, it's a very deep and a difficult question, but let me say this, that the, and I'll try to keep it short, the, um, the, um, the, I think the economics, and not surprisingly when you think about it, is really very positive force in both directions here. Because economics gives a different kind of identity from religious identity, community identity, civilizational identity, or for that matter, national identity. What it does do, on one side there is market economy expanding, you get into, as David Hume was saying, as I was quoting, saying that we now know about people whose existence we did not know because we traded with them. So that's one side. That sounds like a pro-capitalist argument. But think of the anti-capitalist argument, that the, you know, the world is being beaten down by the capitalists, we ought to protest against it, we ought to go to the anti-globalization movement and we ought to be joined, and again, after all, the first international, second international, third international, were working class movements against capitalism. So there's a long history on the economic side of globalism, which is also the other side. Now, they happen to be on the economic front in, in class with each other. But jointly, they provide a different perspective altogether from the religiosity, the civilizational categorizer, Huntington and, and Fuad and, and others. And they provide a completely different perspective. So in the present context, without entering which is right, one could say that the economic uh, enterprise is a very positive one in adding to the plurality. I do discuss how to deal with global injustice issues 
So may I refer to chapter 7, but I promise not to read it out. Or perhaps I should read it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, I was wondering what immediate tools would you recommend for policymakers? Uh, what immediate tools would you recommend for policymakers when they have to deal with situations uh, where identity, identity loyalties collide, such as in Bosnia and Iraq and elsewhere, when they have to come in and do something right away? Uh, so would you recommend uh, internal, internationalization of the issue immediately or whatever else you might think is Worthwhile. Well, it depends on what the circumstances are. I think in the case of Rwanda, an intervention in early on would have done a lot of good. And some fomenting that came from some European countries, Americans were not greatly involved in that, in the absence of it would have helped too, certainly. But um, I might say also, and this is the time also to remember, that among the victims of Tutsi violence, or Hutu violence, were not only Hutus, uh, but uh, uh, not only Tutsis, but also Tutus, uh, who, uh, Hutus who, who fought against the, that perspective. So local, local resistance is important also. Now, if you're dealing with Iraq, it's a different kind of situation. I think the intervention was a complete mistake. In any case, they were not involved in this kind of fight at all. I mean, the kind of thing that you're describing. I also think that landing your army is not a very good way of beginning democracy in any part of the world. So I think, depending on the circumstances, I'll have given an answer. One of my teachers, Pierre Safa, used to say that one of the difficulties of economic education is that you'll be told again and again that no theory is complete until you can convert the economic theory into a slogan. Now, I don't believe that. So I, I said I'm not going to give you a formula. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you, you talk about the singularity of, of personalities. And but as a person, sort of, rather than look thing, looking at everything through sort of multiple lens, he's, what about a rational choice model that you consider an identity? Yeah, what model? Well, rather than looking at options through varying lenses of your personality, what if when you look at a lens, of, you choose an identity which is a proxy for many of your viewpoints? I mean, you know, whether it be race or class or whatever, it, you also have tie in the relationships of your other selves, of your parents or family or what have you? Well, you know, I, uh, I think, um, where I think I made part company with you is this idea of multiple lens. It makes it sound like a complicated exercise, but there's nothing complicated in my seeing myself as an economist, as a as basically an agnostic of a Hindu background, Indian citizen living in America, a professor at Harvard, and so on. And, and these are not different lenses, these are just descriptions. It's like, you know, the contrast would be like that old Indian story about describing the elephant on the part of three blind men, saying the trunk is the only thing, or the, or the, or the, or the legs are the only thing. That you don't need different lenses to see an elephant, you need one lens to see an elephant. So I think that's what I'm trying to argue. So it is, and I was pleased that someone emphasized that, it's the, it's the descriptive failure, the epistemic failure, which feeds the political confusion. That's what I'm trying to avoid. So I think you and I have the same enterprise in mind, but I would say that the part I'm suggesting, the standard thing I'm suggesting, and I'm not at all new in suggesting it, people have suggested it for thousands of years, is the standard not to recognize that we are complex creatures and we must not be reduced into one-dimensional, miniaturized human beings. Yes. Hi, my name is Vishwa. Um, it seems like you're saying that having a singular identity makes one extremely vulnerable in the world. And just to play devil's advocate for a moment, do you think that perceiving of oneself and others as having these multiplicitous, um, chameleon-like, almost infinite identities, depending on who they're interacting in, with in the world, um, affects our ability to predict other people's behaviors and ultimately to form social networks with other people. Um, in other words, if we can't draw upon something familiar, if we can't draw upon a stereotype that we're already comfortable with, is that going to impact people's ability to invest yeah. in other people? Yeah. Closure. Closure. Okay. <laughs> I would um, say um, that 
A lot of the problems are invented problems. I mean, take the Hutu issue again. It's not any more natural for someone to think himself to be a Hutu, as opposed to a Rwandan, as opposed to perhaps a Kigelian, if that's the city where he's from, or a human being. All these are perfectly natural. There's no difficulty in thinking about them. It's propaganda of the Hutu um, architecture violence, which makes it sense everything else doesn't matter. And that we know the language. I, as a child, I still remember it. How can you talk about these complex things when our women are being raped and our men are being murdered? That battle cry has been repeated everywhere in the world. And that's a way of drowning your intelligence, your vision, and say, you know, that's the equivalent of saying the trunk of the elephant is the only thing, nothing else matters. And it's that that we have to resist. So I think, just as I was resisting earlier, of making it a complicated problem. It isn't a complicated problem to recognize our different identities. The fact that even though we may have, uh, Salman and I come uh, very big divisions, like he comes from Bombay, I come from Calcutta, and hard to think of a bigger division. But, um, and yet, there are many other identities we, we have to share, and there is nothing complex about that. So I would suggest that, and I sympathize with your project, I would, sometimes, I would argue that you have more in things in your favor, makes it easier for you and I to run together on that, than we may think if we construct an artificial barrier as if we have to really fight a mountain there. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but this will have to be the last question. Um, I mean, I'm a medical student, which is just one of my many identities. So um, could you speak here, your one identity. My one, one of my many identities. Um, my question is, uh, it's very similar to the last question about multiplicity of identities, and I guess it's basically, how do you balance the psychological need for belonging to a group and to feeling that importance, while at the same time recognizing that, yes, I do have multiple identities, but I have a psychological need to feel like I belong. And Regarding what you had talked about, um, Mr. Rushdie, about the flip that some people tend to do with murdering children one day and then working side by side another, um, again, there's that herd mentality, which is that psychological issue. And I was just wondering what your perspective on is on that subject. I think this is a very, very difficult, uh, but very, very, very important question. There is no question that the the communitarian pursuit of a singular identity is greatly helped by a sense of belonging that many people feel. I mean, I must say, I have never felt uh, one identity would be ever adequate for me. But uh, I know people who have a kind of sense of peace and quiet in just having one preeminent identity. It typically hits, hits like like when you're 40 or 45, suddenly you discover a member of the community and an enormous number of things come back which was not a part of your life. I think that's certainly a factor to be recognized. But then, I, I don't think our ability to reason go away. And it depends on, you know, there's nothing to indicate that that identity needs drown other things. If you have a sense of community identity, that need not drown your political identity. Gandhi, for example, unlike me, was extremely religious Hindu, which Jinnah, who was wanting partition uh, for a Muslim, Muslims in the subcontinent, was not he a poor and drank whiskey. At the same time, despite that strong religious identity, which I believe in Gandhi's case was quite important, they did not in any way dim his insistence on secularism. Uh, we could argue what kind of secularism was it adequate or not, but certainly he remained strong and secular. He did think that the party, to, to think about religious identity in the political context would be a mistake. He also meant specifically that the prayer meetings should never be political, congress meetings, all personal prayer meetings at home. So I think it is possible to accommodate a sense of belonging which we need for many purposes and the human predicament is one of the reasons that we dispose us to in that direction. But it is by thinking, and that's why I think thinking is so important, is we could combine it 
with the, all the other identity that we also have. And if I may come back to Salman's thing, also, I know that after the Gujarat village, for example, a lot of Indians who had moved, a lot of Hindus who had been, there was a lot of flirting going on about this Hindu view of India. A lot of it peaked at that time. And yet, I think the sight of the violence, the riots, the bodies, pictures, including some that we saw, not as gruesome perhaps as the children that some of them describing, for the kind of wake-up call of people, recognizing that there is an other side to that identity, of which you should be ashamed. Salman made that lovely passage saying, we have to take responsibility, we have to be ashamed of it. And if you have a sense of belonging, and yet that belonging seems to also generate that violence, that belonging should suggest critical questions which we have to examine. So it really, I end up, I'm afraid, as a kind of groupie of reasoning and thinking rather than just feeling and letting go. Someone, I must say, you did very well.